unless we're able to say, no, actually, the anti-racism we want right now is something that's much more about dealing with this structure that's not only um, screwing people who aren't white, but obviously the same structures are also screwing people who are white in different ways, right? And so, you know, we have to get to that point where we can where we can start to talk about it on those terms. And that enables us to build new kinds of unity um, to, to take this stuff on. I don't think we're going to be able to do it through the Labour Party anytime soon. It's 2023 and everybody is an anti-racist, including all of us here at Navarra Media, to the likes of BlackRock and Walmart. But does that mean that the term no longer really means anything? And could some forms of anti-racism actually be hindering us addressing the problem of racism? And that's the thesis of my guest today. Arun Kudnani is the author of The Muslims Are Coming. He has a new book out now. And he thinks that you can't have a meaningful anti-racism unless you accompany it with anti-capitalism. Arun, welcome to Downstream. Thank you very much. For our audience, it is Arun, isn't it? It's Arun. Arun. Yeah. Arun and Arun. <laughs> we were talking just before the show, actually, how um, you wanted it to be pronounced properly after about 25, because most people kind of couldn't. They, most people pronounced your name like they pronounced my name. For right. You. During your childhood? Yeah, well, like when I turned up to school for the first time at age five, um, you know, I'm saying, oh, hi, my name's Arun. And they're like, Aaron. I'm like, no, Arun. Aaron. And we go back and forth a little. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Aaron. So when I, you know, right through school, everyone called me Aaron. Come home, my parents called me Arun. Um, and then, um, yeah, when I was about 25, I was like, you know, starting to read and get into, and yeah, I was involved in anti racist politics. So I was like, it's, Kind of weird that you're doing this. You know, like there's a bit of a contradiction here. So um, I started. I started to new people that I met had always introduced myself as a run. I'd let my older friends continue to call me Aaron, which they, you know, some of them still do. And I don't, it doesn't bother me, but I do think it's an opportunity to kind of do something in, in on that level when when it's new people that you meet. So tell me then about your heritage, your background, because it's really interesting. Well, my my dad's Cindy, and Cindy is is uh, part of. Pakistan. It's the southern part of Pakistan where Karachi is. And he was one of those people who um, was a partition refugee in 1947. So he moved from what became Pakistan to uh, to Bombay um, with his extended family. And my mum is from Holland, um, uh, a Dutch Catholic. Um, yeah. So then she she was living in Holland when she met my dad. He was on holiday there um, in 1969. And um they fell in love and um, she moved to live with him in London. He'd already moved to London and, um, and then I was born in 1970. Wow. And now you live in the United States. I moved to New York City in 2010 um, and now I've been living in Syracuse, which is in upstate New York, and I'm about to move to Philadelphia. Oh, Philly, so, so just, for, just for our audience, you are an academic, you're a writer. Well, I'm a writer. I, I haven't, you know, academia doesn't want me. But you, you, you've been <laughs> in work, I have worked in academia. Yeah, I have worked in academia. What does your Twitter bio say? It says I'm a writer on, on racial capitalism well, let's go and, writer and stuff then. like that. Let's go with writer. <laughs> so, so you went to the US and, and, and how's that worked out for you? How are you finding it? I mean, the way I look at it is I've moved from one empire to another, you know, like it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard to buy the sort of old story of, uh, but I think a lot of people, a lot of people from England who moved to the United States tell themselves this story that, you know, I can be free to be who I really am. And like, they don't look at class and they, you know, they don't judge you by your accent and all this sort of stuff. I don't really, you know, I don't think that's what America is. Um, and, um, so, you know, it, I feel like moving from London to New York city is, is those are probably the two cities in the world of like major world cities are the most similar. They both work in very similar ways. It didn't feel like a, you know, like a leap into some cultural different thing. You know, um, there's a different, there is, you know, all the usual things, a different sense of humor. And the difference, you know, the difference for South Asians is significant because the United States um, immigration policy around South Asians is, is not about, you know, what our history was of, of bringing South Asians into Britain uh, from a you know from a long history of colonialism, then bringing them in to do jobs that other people didn't want to do originally. Um, whereas in America, it's like bringing the PhDs after 1965, um, and so it's you know it's a different story by and large. Um, so you don't get racialized in the same way over there. That's a different um, class story, right? Because you've got totally. someone like Tower Hamlets, which yeah. is overwhelmingly you know Bengali, one mm -hmm. of the most deprived areas of the country, 
Right. Uh, whereas, like you say, South Asians in California are going to have above average income, more likely to be university graduates and so on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and it speaks to the way that, you know, like race does work very differently in the States. Like the, because it is a, a place where white people from Europe settled and colonized and then lived there. Right. And, and, and so on the one hand, you've got, and, and, and you know, and, and, ensla- and enslaved people were, were built a country, right? Um, so it's a site of genocide, it's a site, site of enslavement. Now, Britain's also done those things, mm. but it's done it somewhere else. But we can kind of tell ourselves in Britain, we can tell ourselves a story of, you know, well, that, that's not really part of our history here. It is, it's just that it was easier to hide it. So our racism's more polite, you know, in, in the United States, it's, you know, it's, it's like much more likely to be rude uh, and carried out, you know, uh, you know, on an interpersonal level to be rude and carried out by a guy with a gun, you know, because the, um, because that, that is the, the, they're in the, the forefront of a, of a kind of settler colonial project there that, that was more hidden here. So we are discussing today this book, what is anti-racism and why it means anti-capitalism. As you can see, it's already well thumbed. This is my proof copy. You can get your own one uh, in, in bookstores soon. It's out with Verso. It's a brilliant book, Aaron. Thank you. Aaron. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a really, really, really brilliant book. Uh, you've also just written an article and that's up in The Guardian. Right. It talks about some of the themes there, but I have to say the book is really worth investing in, in terms of time and, and thinking, because there's just so many fascinating vignettes and anecdotes, and hopefully we'll be able to go over a lot of that today. Um, to start with, where does the word racism come from in the English language? Where have we inherited this word from? Yeah, so... so- you know, it's, it's not as old as you might expect, right? And really, it starts to get used regularly only in the 1930s. And the actual origin of it in that moment is um, a guy called Magnus Hirschfeld, who's a um, German, Jewish, gay, uh, gay rights campaigner um, and, and a, a sexologist. He established an institute of sexology, and he's actually the person who comes up with the term transvestite. And, you know, that's one of the things he's researching. And... Um, he, you know, obviously when the Nazis come to power in 1933, he's, he's out there, he's driven out of the country, they burn down his institute and so on. Um, and while he's in exile, he writes a book called Rassismus in German. Um, that is his attempt to make sense of like how the Nazis came to power. And he, Rassismus translates into English as racism. And that's where the term enters the English language as a kind of regular term of a, of a kind of scholarly analysis. And... Um, what he's basically arguing in that book is um, that there are racial prejudices that have kind of been deposited in people's minds as a result of scientific racism in the 19th century. Um, so it's about doctrine, it's about ideas, beliefs, and, and that if you have a society where those racial prejudices are you know, prevalent, then it opens up an opportunity for uh, extremist politicians like the Nazis to to manipulate those beliefs and come to power through hatred, and then that's a threat to liberal democracy. And so that's his, you know, he's he, that's his analysis of of what how Hitler comes to power, puts racism at the center of it, which I think not many people were doing at that time, and um, and and that gives us a a general understanding of what racism is from that from that book. Um, but it's not a very good way of thinking about racism today. We'll talk about that more in a moment. Yeah. So what, what was the conventional account then for the rise of Hitler at the time? Because obviously for us, it seems quite obvious that a big part of this was um, a form of racial superiority um, among white Germans uh, that they hold over yeah. other sort of non-Germans, according yeah. to the, the Third Reich. So how at the time did the French and the British, and I mean, of course, you know, mainstream thinking, not, you know, yeah, British or yeah, French yeah, communists. Yeah. So, so I think you know, like he's he's early early into this, right? So that, you know, he's writing this book in in kind of the mid nineteen thirties. It's translated um, in uh, nineteen thirty eight, right? So, um, you know, I think ideas are still forming all across the board in terms of like how to make sense of it. But I think two, you know, two alternative ideas that would have been floating around at the time would have been um, that. This is this is a, a, an immediate result of the um, the, the kind of uh, overly cruel um, effects of the Ver, you know the Versailles Treaty, right? And so it's not it's it's kind of moving away from ideology to thinking about a very specific kind of recent history, um, or um, you know thinking about it in terms of another Mussolini, right? And so an idea of fascism, and then within that there might be all kinds of ways that people are starting to think about what fascism is. 
Um, but thinking of it as, as, you know, the Italian paradigm would have been the one that would be the starting point for that rather than the Nazi paradigm. And so therefore you're less likely to think of racism as central. Because there's a lot of scholars and, and thinkers and writers, and we'll talk about this later on, who draw clear analogies and equivalences between the rise of fascism, particularly in Germany, and the British Empire. Mm. Um, and obviously, even today, if you were to say that to many Brits, they would get very upset and very yeah, angry. Yeah. Uh, but that's the other kind of anti-racism we'll talk about more in a moment. Before we do, though, um, the word racism had also been used in France, hadn't it, at this point? So it's not just a, a purely German word, or that's right, the, the right, use of right. racism we've inherited, really. Right. So I think Hirschfeld gets it from, from coming across the word in French of racism, which is starting to be used in the 1930s, I think, by um, like anti-fascist activists in France who are, who are seeing the rise of fascism in their country and other countries in Europe. And they're using that word to capture this thing that's to do with race. So we have race in the 19th century. We don't really have this idea of racism until the 1930s, really. Right. Everybody's talking about anti-racism right now. Right. And you detail this in the book. It's really, it makes me laugh, really. BlackRock, Walmart. Um, it's the topic of so many books. You know, Robin D'Angelo's White Fragility seems to be the paradigmatic one. Other ones too, of course. Well, why is that? Why is absolutely everybody obsessed right now, including the corporate class, with, with being an anti-racist? Well, I mean, I think the immediate, you know, the immediate cause is the summer of 2020 um, when, I mean, in the United States, you had 15 million people on the streets um, as part of the Black Lives Matter protests, right? So that's, you know, if that number's right, that's the New York Times reporting, then that's the largest, you know, that's the largest um, protest or movement in US history, right? Um, and, and, you know, I was there at the time. If you go, you know, I mean, my impression of it was um, that that number was, would have been right. Um, uh, and the average age would have been something like 16 years old. Wow. And, and, you know, 16 year old kids running around, um, taking over streets, using apps that I haven't even heard of to organize themselves. Um, and it was incredibly powerful. And, um, you know, Monmouth University did a survey um, that summer saying, um, you know, what do you think about these protests? What's legitimate? And, the, you know, the majority of people in the United States um, said that burning down of a police station in Minneapolis, which is one of the things that protesters did, that was where George Floyd was killed, burning down that police station was justified or partially justified, right? So this is, you know, to get that kind of opinion coming out in the United States is tells you that something very, very powerful going on here, right? So I think then what you're talking about in terms of like, you know, the books that are then coming out, all the initiatives from uh, CEOs at corporations and all the initiatives at universities, all of that is, is sort of um, a, a product of what's happening on the streets, but also a distortion of it. Because what they're doing then is saying, well, we're going to pursue, we're going to pursue something called anti-racism, but actually what they pursue is something very different from what people on the streets are after. Because what people on the streets are after is, you know, remember the slogans were things like defund the police, uh, abolish ICE. ICE is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement um, in the United States, right? So it's not saying um, we need to, we need to deal with, you know, individual officers who've gone against the kind of professional norms that their organization has or, you know, kind of bad apples. It's about these entire, this entire infrastructure of policing and incarceration and border controls needs to be dismantled. That was the kind of center of gravity of what people were saying. Um, but then what we see at the level of, you know, the kind of discussions, you know, universities weren't saying, um, okay, well, we want to respond to Black Lives Matter. How can we put our resources that we have in this you know, pretty, pretty well resourced university in the service of this movement. Can we offer up rooms to have meetings in? Can we like, you know, collaborate with people to do political education work? No, what they're saying is, is let's hire in some professionals to do some unconscious bias training and let's, um, uh, you know, kind of do um, uh, a lot of work on um, thinking about diversity and microaggressions and so on. It's a very different kind of discourse, right? And so, but it is, it is tied to what's happening on the streets, but uh, it's a, a perverse kind of version of it. You have this great quote. Again, it, it makes me chuckle. Um, I've, this isn't the verbatim quote, but it's more or less what you write, which is that this has generated a form of liberal anti-racism, which is akin to a form of self-development. 
Yeah. And of course, I, I've had that in my mind for so long, but just reading the examples you give of, of BlackRock and Walmart and very, yeah. various initiatives, yeah. should we look at some of this stuff as basically an extension of a self-help genre? I think so. I mean, I think, um, you know, this, so I think the way that um, a lot of this stuff operates is, you know, there's the podcast, there's the books, there's the, um, you know, at one point there was even a, an outfit that was saying you could pay like $200 and you do an anti-racist dinner party and you sit around and, you know, you have um, a room of white people and then a South Asian woman and a black woman at the other end of the table kind of berate the white people and, and this, is, this is meant to be productive, right? And so- And people paid for this? Yeah, quite a lot of money. Quite a lot of money for that. For that. <laughs> so, yeah. But so, Navarro, we should diversify. That's another revenue stream. Sorry. Yeah, but another meaning of diversify. Yeah. But, yeah. but like the, um, you know, so, so I, think, I think there is a large part of it that is um, about uh, this idea that white people kind of have something inside them, this unconscious bias, that if we just, work, if, you know, you as an individual just do the work, that was the phrase, right? Do the work. You can bring this stuff out and make yourself a morally better person, right? Um, and um, so in that, you know, in that sense, it's, it's, um, it's got overlaps with self-help, but it's got this strong moral element as well, you know? Um, and, um, and, and to me, that's, that's just not, that's a distraction at best, um, harmful in, in a lot of ways as well, right? Um, we, I can get into why, but like, um, I, I just don't see what, so, if we're dealing, if we're talking about structural racism, right, which is what everyone, I mean, that was the phrase that everyone used, right? Structural racism or systemic racism. You got you know, Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock saying, yeah, let's take, that. he's using that phrase, systemic racism, right? Now, if, it's, if you're seriously talking about taking on structural racism, it's not a thing that you're going to do by addressing your own individual prejudices, unconscious biases, attitudes, and so on. Right. The only way you break down structural racism is if you can build organizations, build collective power that that can deal with what is a power relationship and and counter that, right? And and start to dismantle these structures and build new social structures. Right. That's that and so the question of of like where do individuals fit into that is a question, right? We need to figure that out. But it's not it, we never get to that point where we're getting individuals to reform themselves and then somehow they having done that they go on to to be part of some kind of collective power that, that never we never get to that point we just get trapped in these in these kind of processes and that tells me that the motivation is is not to make yourself into a better uh, member of some kind of organizational collective power it's actually about you there's something narcissistic about it mm. you know it's centering white people i mean yeah you could put it that way i mean if it, i mean if, that, if that's if you're saying that, like you say, you're doing the work, well, who's doing the work and to who? And it is, like you say, if, if we're going to accept this idea that it's, a, an, it's an extension of self-development, and it sort of does feel like it's... So, yeah. I mean, the way... So, the, um, you know, one of the, one of the really great um, kind of anti-racist thinkers that I, that I draw on in the book is uh, Asa Van Anden, you know, who was based in Britain for most of his life. And, um, um, you know, what, the way he looked at this was... Um, you know, yeah, like obviously there's something about, you know, as you as an in individual white person, like addressing your own prejudices, right? And getting to the point where you've got rid of those, right? But he called it potty training. What he meant is you've basically achieved the, the minimum level of an adult human being, right? You can, you, you know, you can kind of operate now in the, you know, welcome, welcome to humanity. Now you're able to talk to other human beings in a way where you're not being patronizing or prejudiced and, you know, like caught up in, in this stuff, right? That's great. But that's, that's not, um, that's, that is just kind of at one side from the actual struggle that, that we have right now, because that's about dealing with, um, like the structures can operate irrespective of whether someone has individual prejudices or not. You know, like if you have a, um, you know, if you have, immigration officers carrying out a deportation, that immigration officer could have done a great job working on their unconscious biases. And, you know, they really know how to use the right words to describe the poor guy that they're bundling in mm. a plane and, and like possibly sending to his death, mm. right? They're still doing the deportation because that deportation isn't the result of even a lot of individual prejudices. It's the result of the way that the whole 
global system of racial capitalism requires a certain kind of division of labor around the world and uses borders to uphold that. Mm. Well, unless we start to talk on that level, we're not getting anywhere. Mm. You know? Well, we'll talk about that more in a moment. I mean, the, the classic example for me here in recent British politics is with the Labour Party. And I know some people get upset with me for bashing the Labour Party so much. But I think it's particularly useful here because they claim and they aspire to uphold certain values and sometimes they don't, you know, they don't live up to that. So you have this really funny example, not funny, it's tragic, frankly, of them blocking black socialists from standing for public office. But then at the same time, they have this, we have a program and if you, you know, the Bernie Grant program, the leadership program, right. and we have unconscious bias training for all our staff at party right. headquarters, right. even though we've disproportionately laid off more people of color right. and we've disproportionately hired more white men, right. that doesn't matter because right. we've had the unconscious bias training and you know we, right. we, we've ticked the right boxes and so on. And it does feel like, and perhaps this is why I really like the book, because it feels very fitting for the present moment that after COVID and after BLM, it does feel like a big, big section, and they're very well-meaning people, many of them, yeah. of, of the liberal intelligentsia, the liberal elite, the liberal establishment. They look at BLM, climate change, the LGBT stuff, and they say, okay, you know, our society and capitalism is changing. If you want to sell products, if you want to start a business, if you want to do audience acquisition in this brave new world, these are the things you need to claim to believe. Yeah. And like, that's a very different place to saying, how do we address racism? Right, right. And, and you know, I think, I mean, that, so th what the Labour Party has done is just simply absorb the standard kind of stuff that every you know, every human resources department does for every big corporation, right? Around the, the diversity stuff, right? And training and so on. It's nothing different from that. And so it tells you that they have um, given up on the idea that the Labour Party might, uh, might be precisely that kind of collective power that might actually dismantle structural racism. I mean, instead, it's simply about um, uh, the, the, the kind of... Um, liberal anti-racism diversity politics that is that everyone does now and doesn't change anything right and and that is you know historically um for better or worse the labor party was the, the place that a lot of people who you know south asian people and african caribbean people it was the place that a lot of people looked to um to be the vehicle for change right but at this point um uh, it's hard to see that you know being a it, you know, any hope of that at all in the Labour Party. What did you um, make of Keir Starmer taking the knee? Because obviously this guy could be the next prime minister and that's a, that really upset a lot of people on the right. I, I, think it's, I think it's completely redundant. I think, it, you know, this kind of style of politics of dealing with anti-racism is, um, is a distraction, you know, and, and we need to, that's, you know, that's why for me, the central argument is we need to distinguish between this kind of diversity politics, this liberal anti-racism and what a, a more radical alternative might be because um, the right doesn't make that distinction. Obviously, why would they, right? They want to lump it all together and and take the the bits that are obviously, or, or not even obviously, but can be plausibly presented as somewhat ridiculous, somewhat preachy, somewhat el elitist, and say that is what anti-racism is. So unless we're able to say, no, actually, the anti-racism we want right now is something that's much more about dealing with this structure that's not only um, screwing people who aren't white, but obviously the same structures are also screwing people who are white in different ways, right? And so, you know, we have to get to that point where we can, where we can start to talk about it on those terms. And that enables us to build new kinds of unity um, to, to take this stuff on. I don't think we're going to be able to do it through the Labour Party anytime soon. So do you think that this liberal anti-racist discourse then is actually a barrier to cross-class multiracial coalitions to well, I mean, it is, it, is in so far as, it is a barrier to the extent that that is what passes for anti-racism in, in general, you know, in the general understanding of what it might mean. But also, so, is, it, is, is it a barrier? Because you're talking about building the kinds of coalitions where you say, look, there is a system here, which you talked about the racialization of, of global production and, and, and the purpose that borders serve, et cetera. Um, and this disadvantages different people in different ways, not all the same, but it's still in many people's interest to change that. And it does feel like liberal anti-racism saying something quite different right which is yeah. yeah white working class people we're going to constantly tell you off right and it's very hard to bring somebody into your coalition when they, they feel like they're constantly being told off it's i mean it's hard to bring white working class people or white people in general into yeah. a, a, co a coalition anyway right that might that might look to liberation of you know of 
um, brown and black people, right? That's hard to do anyway because of our history, right? Yeah. So I don't think that's the, the chief barrier, but it doesn't help. Um, we, um, and, and actually, like, I don't think, I don't think anti-racism necessarily always requires a, uh, unity with white people. That's one way of doing it in certain contexts where white people are amenable to that. But if they're not, we'll do it other ways. You know, there's other ways of doing it. I mean, that's, that's what we've got in our history. We've got different options around that. You know, what's going on with, with, um, the kind of liberal elite version of anti-racism is, is this idea that, um, the problem is white working class people, uneducated, still locked in their prejudices that us more, you know, more liberal, wealthy people have, have figured out to, how to get beyond that with all our podcasts and everything that we've done, right? So we're beyond that. Now we've got to educate these, these poorer people to get them up to our level. Well, that's, that's not the radical anti-racist tradition. And, and also what it misses is that it's precisely those liberal elites who are the ones who, um, who create the most brutal parts of, of our structural racist world, right? Like they're the ones who are upholding the border control system. They're the ones who want mass incarceration, actually. They're the ones who, who want the, you know, police forces to protect their neighborhoods with violence, right? And so, um, they're kind of, what they're doing there is, you know, how convenient for them that there's, there is some white working class racism for them to justify what they would want to do anyway. You know, they've, that's why they constantly say, uh, you know, we want Britain to be an open, diverse, welcoming place. Um, uh, but we've also got to take seriously the genuine concerns being expressed by, you know, working class mm. people. And so we, do, we, we will need to toughen up our immigration control and so on. You know, that's, that's a trick going on there. They, will, they want to toughen up those border controls anyway, because it's part of how the, the system works, right? Mm. They, there's a, it's driven by something else. It's not driven by the, Oh, you, you know, suddenly we're taking white working class public opinion really seriously on this one occasion because we don't on any other occasion. Yeah, you know, yeah, it is fascinating, isn't it? Like, um, I've had conversations in the last few months where people talk about the centre, <clears throat> you know, the political centre, and the political centre. If you look at any polling, the political centre on things like law and order, criminal justice, migration is to the right of the conservatives, and then on public services, wages, inequality, high pay. It's the left of Labour. Yeah. So if yeah. you were talking about the actual sense, you'd have a party which incorporates both these things. Obviously, I don't agree with a lot of that, but that's just that's just an empirical observation. But like I say, it's fascinating that, you know, you have a political class which is very eager to listen to, uh, you right. know, the white workers. We have to hear their concerns. Right. Why won't you hear their concerns about public ownership of water? Yeah, you know, wh absolutely. Why, no, where's absolutely. that gone? You have a great absolutely. quote here from that Guardian article. Liberal anti-racists are powerless against this new structural racism. They demand we use the correct racial vocabulary, shaming conservative MPs or sports commentators when they use derogatory terms. But abolishing a word does not abolish the social forces it expresses. A very lucid, pithy sentence. What does that mean? Well, you know, so much of what passes for kind of public discourse around race nowadays, especially in Britain, I think more even than, than uh, the United States, is is just let's just get us to use the correct words right and you know i'm glad that um i haven't heard anyone use packy for a really long time you know walking around the streets of britain because you used to um but but where we're at now is is it's almost like that's all that anti-racism has become um and and it's the sense that if we can just get that right then everything you know all, all the other problems can kind of start to fall into place and the and what what's happened is is that we've just we've just found ways for the for the kind of deep structural inequalities to continue even when we aren't being abused you know because they don't work through the constant need to assert racial superiority in that explicit way anymore they work through um kind of more abstract market processes or they work through what are presented as race neutral um you know infrastructures like like policing, like borders, like the military, uh, like prisons and so on, right? And so you, with all of that stuff in place, they don't need to be, um, you know, uh, uh, doing the kind of stuff that I grew up with of, of the abuse on the streets and stuff like that to keep the system going. They don't need that anymore. And there's this shift as well, which you illuminate uh, between racial distinctions have now become cultural distinctions. Right. So, and, and you hear this all the time, you know, we, we don't share the same culture as these people coming from Afghanistan and Iran and so on and so forth. To some extent it's true, but then you could equally say, well, you know, an affluent 
Tory voter in the southeast of England doesn't really share much culturally with a working class Glaswegian from Easter House, where the average life expectancy is 60. Yeah. So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of essentialism when it comes to culture, which isn't, isn't quite right. But th- this idea of culture, and this was again fascinating for me, has changed over time, much like that, that word racism. So you talk about how culture in the 19th century used to really be, a, albeit Eurocentric, universal idea uh, that we can all be elevated as individuals. And, you know, really it, it, it appeals to the sort of, you know, the human is comprised of the angel and the ape in the words of Alexander Pope and, and culture takes us towards that angel. Right. And, and what you're saying happens in the sort of 19th, early 20th centuries with colonialism is that actually culture becomes a new vehicle for um, really enveloping um, what were previously racial differences. And we get yeah. cultural relativism as a as a result. Can you talk about that? A yeah. Bit? So you know, this is really um, what comes out of thinkers like Franz Boas and Ruth Benedict in the United States, anthropologists who, um, kind of in the first few decades of the twentieth century, are starting to question that kind of nineteenth century thinking that there's this kind of hierarchy of civilization, you know, with with white people at the top, and that is also a cultural hierarchy in the sense you just described that you know at the top we have culture, we you know we. We, and at the bottom, it's kind of primitivism, that kind of thing. So what you get in, it, you know, in the work of Boaz especially is this idea that, well, actually, there's, there's multiple cultures. There's cultural diversity, right? That's where that, you know, really that notion of cultural diversity comes from Boaz. Cultural diversity. And each culture is kind of self-contained, right? And so if you're outside that culture, you're never really going to be able to understand it. Um, and certainly what we can't do is put all these different cultures um, on in any kind of hierarchy, right? And so that's, that's you know, a really important move there to, to take on this 19th century um, sense of kind of civilizational racism, right? But it does mean that, and, and you know, Boaz is, is coming out of his university to, to become a public advocate for this argument by the time the Nazis are, are in power in Germany, because, and he sees it as part of the work of, of challenging the racism that's central to Nazi ideology, right? So, but what, what it opens up is the possibility that Boas doesn't take up, but others do later, of saying, well, okay, well, in, we'll take your point. There isn't this kind of racial hierarchy, but instead, like, we can look at the world in terms of cultural differences that aren't, um, uh, even if we don't put them in a hierarchy, we can still mobilize a kind of argument about cultural difference mm. to say each culture has the right to keep its own culture protected, yeah. right? <clears throat> kind of what Enoch Powell does. I mean, that's his innovation really is to say, um, uh, I don't, he says, I'm not a racist. I don't believe in biological ideas of racial hierarchy. I just think that the English people have a distinctive culture, right? And that needs to be protected. And that's why we can't have immigration, right? And that's why we need repatriation, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the culture becomes a, 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 you know, if you, if you believe that culture is fixed, that becomes a possibility, right? But culture isn't fixed. Cu- you know, the nature of culture is that it moves around, it changes, um, it's fluid, right? And culture is something we're constantly making. Uh, and so, you know, that's the, that's the, the sort of philosophical problem with, with Powell's position and all the other, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, seeing Powell as the person who came up with that, but kind of everyone says it, you know, like every, every politician when they're trying to justify their immigration policy, you know, new labor, conservative party, whatever, they talk about, um, uh, you know, some notion of, of British values and, you know, we can't be overwhelmed by other cultures and so on, you know, that's standard for every European country. Have you watched the um, TV adaptation of uh, Handmaid's Tale? Uh, a little. A little. I I love it. I think it's really good. And there's this amazing scene, which brings this home about cultural relativism, where you have Offred, who's the handmaid of, you know, one of these commanders. And they're talking, I think, to Canadians or Americans, because obviously you've got the Republic of Gilead now, so this is an American government in exile. And they're like, how can you treat these handmaidens like this? It's so appalling. And he says, this is our culture. Right, no, you right, right, right. Please don't overstep this. this is, uh-huh. And it's quite a woke language. Right? I, mm-hmm. I don't want to use that word in the way that you right. Know, the right do. Right, but it's, right, right. It, the, the performance of it was quite like, actually, is quite progressive, you know. Yeah. This is our culture. Can you please just show a little bit of sensitivity? This yeah. is how we like to organize things, actually. It's like, yeah. you know, it's a sex slave, frankly. Yeah. Um, and I, I was like, whoa. And, you know, I, I, the left has obviously defended aspects of cultural relativism for, for a really long time because it is important to understand that, you know, uh, the West shouldn't try and impose its culture on the rest of the planet, of course. But this idea, again, 
fundamentally, Enoch Powell plays such an enormous role in this, besides other stuff too. But yeah, you see it too with people like Douglas Murray, right? And right, lots, of, exactly. lots of the far right today, they say, the death of, why is Europe dying? And they will say, it's not just the race, because I'm not, I'm not a racist, it's also the culture. Yeah. And that yeah. does seem like this incredibly important field now for, for anti-racists. Yeah. And I think, I think the, um, you know, I think this is where it gets interesting in terms of connecting this to um, neoliberalism, right? And the neoliberal kind of intellectual tradition. Because I think the reason, the basic reason why these arguments about culture have become not just kind of central to a lot of the kind of discourse around race and immigration and so on, but also actually, I think they are central to um, a huge amount of policy making around, um, you know, in all kinds of areas around global development and around, um, uh, you know, economic policies and so on, right? Is and the, and the reason is is because for neoliberalism there is a there is a basic problem, uh, a, a kind of basic contradiction at the core of neoliberalism, which is that their project is to try and create a world in which all our relationships to each other are mediated through markets, right? But the fact is, is that most of us don't want to live like that, right? I mean, let alone the rest of the world, but even in countries like Britain and the United States, most of us don't want to live like that. We want to live in societies where we have a kind of modicum of care for each other and we don't just trample over each other trying to compete with each other. So it's the neoliberals have a problem of like, how can you, how can you impose this vision on societies that don't want it? And you don't want to be having to coerce everyone all the time to go along with their market vision, right? So what you, what neoliberalism is about is, you know, the sort of philosophical elements of neoliberalism are all about how do we create the cultural conditions for this market order that basically we know can't just kind of um, survive by the free choice of, of humanity, right? And so neoliberals get into this game of like constantly looking around the world and looking at different population groups and saying, um, are these people um, culturally adapted to be uh, to have the right values to participate in a neoliberal society? Are they entrepreneurial? Are they thrifty? Are they um, uh, willing to uh, accept the discipline of markets when they they don't win in markets? You know, um, uh, do they do they have ties to a broader community or that they want you know they want to share things with, or are they private property hoarders? Right, which is what neoliberalism requires you to be. And and of course, when you do that, and and when you meet resistance from um, uh, people who who have been colonised and are resisting the imposition of neoliberalism, right through the twentieth century, late twentieth century, um, the neoliberals keep coming back to culture as the explanation, right, for why um, why that resistance exists, mm. right? It becomes the it becomes the the sort of trump card that you can say, well, of course they're resisting. Our vision because they're just culturally not adapted to it. Maybe we need a bit more, a bit more coercion to get them to reform their culture to to enter our modern neoliberal society. Or maybe they're just never going to be reformable, and when we need even more violence, right? And that is that's the kind of core argument I think around um, uh, you know so much of of the kind of neo-colonial apparatus, and then domestically as well in terms of like how different groups get racialized. I mean that's the you know you can trace that in the neoliberal think tanks of how they understand what they're doing when they're doing, you know, when they're advocating for building prisons, when they're advocating for bigger powers uh, for police forces, and when they're advocating for uh, stronger border enforcement, and so on. It's, that's the kind of philosophical underpinning of it that they draw on. Yeah, I remember speaking to Will, Will Davies a few years uh -huh. ago. Very smart man, no longer on Twitter, probably, probably one of the smartest moves he made. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, he wrote a great book about neoliberalism a very long time ago, now maybe 10 years ago. And, yeah. and he really summed this up for me so beautifully because, of course, many people say, well, I know what classical liberalism is. Yeah. What's neoliberalism? You're just yeah, making yeah. that term up. Yeah. And he said the core distinction is for, for classical liberalism, they believe that human nature is homo yeah. economicus. Yeah. yeah. Utility maximizing and so exactly. on and so forth. Yeah. Neoliberals don't believe it's natural right. and right. that it has to be imposed and exactly. that subjects have to be created. Exactly. That's the core difference. Exactly. And, and like you say, when you sort of project that out onto a global theater, it's a really very violent project, actually. Very violent. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, and, and that's, you know the the difference is that in the in the you know when Adam Smith is around in the in the late eighteenth century, you know you can they're they're a class on the rise and they can tell this kind of optimistic story that oh yeah. the world's waiting for us to 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 create this new world of of um, free markets. When you know when Hayek's writing, he's you know he's um, he's seen socialists take over his home city of Vienna. You know 
Um, and he's and he's basically saying since 1870 we've been losing. Our, you know, our, our class and our and the advocates of free markets have been losing. We can't take it for granted anymore. We've got to come up with new ways that we that we create this world that we want, right? That's going to be about violence and it's going to be about um, thinking about culture and how we shape it, right? And um, and that's the difference. And that's why, yeah, absolutely, it's a it's a violin project. And um, uh, uh, you know, if you read if you read any of these neoliberal thinkers carefully, that violence is right there, and it's. It's never about just simply saying um, the state needs to withdraw from the market and let the market do its thing. It's about saying the state needs to constantly supervise to ensure that these rules of competition that they believe in are followed because they won't be if you just sit back. Mm -hmm. People don't want to live like that. So let's go back to this idea of diversity and you draw an interesting genesis for it with the Indian mutiny, which is what, the 1850s? 1857, yeah, yeah. How does that work? Well, so you know, you've got um, you've got this situation where Britain's colonised India. It's extracting all this wealth. That's why it's colonised India. Um, and uh, and you get the 1857 uprising, which um, you know is is violent on both sides, um, and it throws the British right. It's a it's one of those moments where you get a kind of. Uh, Reflection back in London. What went wrong? How did we, you know, how, how come this this thing happened? Um, that we, you know, it's a, it's a, a uprising. And so, the, the the kind of view that emerges in London is well, um, again, it's culture, right? There's something about the um, the culture of of India that makes them um, resistant to the modernizing project that we're trying to impose on India, right? Um, you know, they would have called it a civilizing mission, but essentially what they meant is um, we, you know, f our rule of India is benevolent because we're gradually bringing India up the civilizational scale to the point where they have these values of, you know, individual ownership of private property and not a communal ownership uh, society, right? And, um, and then with the, you know, with the uprising, they're like, oh, I guess, I guess they're not, they're not going to be led up this path. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to kind of force this transformation on, on Indian society that we wanted. We're going to have to find a new way of ruling so that we can continue to extract wealth, but without pushing them down this path that they don't want to go. So they come up with this idea of let's get um, uh, a really detailed kind of survey of the different, cultural, the different cultures in, in, in the Indian population. Let's map them all out. Let's... Let's give each particular culture um, a kind of representation in some kind of relatively superficial kind of structure of government where it's not representation, but it's like, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an appearance of representation there by having uh, representatives appointed by the colonial system um, and, and giving them the sense that, you know, within your particular cultural space, as long as you don't challenge the overall structure and you don't challenge our project that's a about extracting this wealth, you do your cultural life how you want it. And um, uh, you, so you have a little cultural space there to do your thing. Um, and, you know, so then you have, you know, different, what would call called uh, personal codes for different um, religious groups, different castes and so on. So it, they see it as a way of stabilizing the economic structure that they've built. Um, and, and certainly for, for um, a period it worked. Um, and, that's, and that's really, um, you know, Mahmoud Mandani has written about this and, you know, kind of familiar with the idea of divide and rule. He calls it define and rule because what is central to it is that the categories that are being created here aren't kind of organically there in the, in the society in the form that they end up in. They have to be kind of created. Um, once you, you know, if you go into an Indian village and you say in, um, you know, 18, 1860s or so when they're starting to do these, these big censuses, you know, who's... Hindu, it's a kind of meaningless question, right? It's not how people see themselves. But after a few decades, the bureaucracy has created the category of a Hindu and given it a sense that, oh, well, this is a certain population group in this society that's entitled to a certain representation and so on, right? And so it's, it's defining rule. You're defining these groups and enabling your rule through that definition of them. Um, and that's, that's, that's where we, you know, there is a line from that through to, um, you know, because the same bureaucrats who were running that system then when you start to get, um, you know, 1950s, 1960s, um, people coming 
to Britain from <laughs> South Asia, the same categories are then applied and the same bureaucrats are coming home and running the local authority with the same ideas, you know, around, oh, well, we'll need some multicultural representation here. I mean, even the fact that, you know, we call people Asians comes, that's a term that's come back from uh, British colonialism in, in Africa, you know, where the term Asians comes from. So, um, you know, and that's, there's, so there's a line straight up to today and how we think about diversity in Britain today. Because of course, in the US, when you say Asian, it, it generally means East Asian. Yeah, exactly. Generally, yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 these yeah. are generalizations, yeah. whereas here it means South Asian. Absolutely. And, and this is where we get the dreaded, quote unquote, community leader. Um, right, right. And, and communities. Yeah. I yeah, remember yeah. once I was saying to my dad, I think I said the word Iranian community. And he said, son, we don't have a community. We all hate each other, <laughs> which I really liked. And, you know, and I thought it was really funny. But yeah, I, I yeah, think yeah. this is such an oppressive word for people from minorities in this country. Obviously, we have a white majority. And I think that the fact that everybody in this country who's not white British has to be sectioned into this little cubby hole. Oh, you're Jewish, you're Iranian, you know, uh, you're West Indian, et cetera, et cetera. These are your communities. And ergo, these are your community leaders. Mm. Well, hold on. I thought, hold on. I thought we were a democracy, one person, one vote. Mm. I thought we believed in civil liberties and mm. you care about mm. the sanctity of the individual. But now you're saying, actually, mm. on the basis of people's color or heritage, this person represents them. Mm -hmm. And it, it just seems so at odds with democracy. And it's one of those things where someone on the right will mock it and they'll say, mm. well, this is a left-wing idea, mm. obviously, mm. Commu community leaders who voted for them. He's like, well, actually, no, this is an inheritance mm. from, from colonialism, yeah, frankly. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I don't think we've ever had, I mean, we've rarely had community leaders. What we've had is people that have been appointed to pretend to represent us, right? I mean, I think, I think it'd be nice to have community leaders, which would mean, um, you know, people who perhaps are, you know, local councillors, people in elected office who, um, or even people who emerge organically through, through some kind of community struggle and, and become prominent, um, who, who genuinely advocate for the rights of, um, people racialized into that community, right? I mean, that would be great, but it, it very, what you typically, what the community leader is, is someone who, um, it presents to the community what is required of them by the system. Yeah. Right. And so that's a different thing. You know, um, one of the people I write about in the book is um, Jamil Alamine, formerly H. Rap Brown, who was one of the leaders of the Black Power movement in the late, late 1960s and so on. And um, so he's someone who, you know, in the early 60s is, is involved in Alabama and Mississippi doing um, organizing for the voting rights, right? To get um, black people in those states the right to vote in order that then they can elect black people to office, political office in those states. and then bring about some kind of transformation in the in the lives of those people. And doing that work meant you could get killed, right? So he's putting his life on the line for that cause. By the end of the 1960s, he's saying the only reason to get, you know, um, a black person elected as mayor in, in an American city, which is starting to happen by then, um, the only point in doing that is if that mayor is willing to basically dismantle things from his office, right, and bring it down. Uh, so... Um, you know, I think that's the correct analysis, right? It's like, there's no, there's nothing inherently valuable in, um, having, um, you know, having our people in, in office, being community, so-called community leaders, being representatives, nothing inherently valuable in that, unless they are actually, um, willing to, to, um, serve that community by bringing down the structures that are oppressing them. You mentioned prisons a moment ago. Um, and, the, and the role they play in this kind of reforging of society after the 1970s. Um, and actually, in, in, in your words, sort of quashing revolutionary sentiments. We'll, we'll talk about them more in a moment. Um, and I think most people will be aware of the tremendous increase in the prison population in the United States. But one thing in particular, and maybe let's start with this, is the role of solitary confinement in what, what are called supermax prisons, right. which don't previously exist. And now there's lots of them. And I think today, I mean, maybe you, you were writing this at the time, I'm sure it's more or less the same now, around 80,000 people are in solitary confinement in the United States, these right. supermax style right. prisons. So where does this come from? What drives the rise in particular of supermax prisons? Yeah. So, you know, the first thing to say is, is um, you know, this kind of term solitary confinement is, it kind of makes it hard to see what really that feels like, right? So what you're talking about is, is isolating people 
um, you know, often for like 24, 23 hours a day. Uh, maybe they get an hour on their own in a yard. Um, and, and it's about cutting off that thing that actually is central to being a human being is relationships with other human beings, right? And so, um, you know, the sort of psychologists who've looked at this talk about how if you experience that kind of isolation for, you know, about three months or so, it starts to become the equivalent of a kind of mental torture. And it has the characteristics of, you know, people who experience it have the characteristics of people who survive torture, right? It's on that scale of, of brutality. But the, the um, you know, the thing about it is that it doesn't feel as brutal as, act, as what we normally think of as torture because it's all, in, it's all about what, what's going on in someone's head, right? And how, how it's breaking down someone's personality. Um, so if you look at the history of where this comes from, um, essentially, it comes out of, some, of experiments that were started in the United States um, in, the, in the early 60s, where um, psychologists who were working with the Federal Bureau of Prisons were looking at um, people who had come back from imprisonment um, in, um, in China or in uh, North Korea and, and, were, and had started to Come up uh, with an, who, who were Americans who, who were, were Americans, fighting communism. Yeah, exactly, who had been prisoners of war or whatever. Um, and, um, and, and starting to, to imagine, to, I mean, it, it wasn't an accurate portrayal of what their experience really was, but they started to come up with these ideas. That actually, what was going on there was kind of communist brainwashing, right? And a sort of idea that you could kind of break down someone's personality to a blank slate and then rebuild them, you know, with some new ideology, right? And so they were, they were like, well, if, if the communists have got this, we should have this <laughs> capability, you know? Um, and so they start doing some experiments with um, African-American prisoners who are in the Nation of Islam, you know, which at the time was um, organizing in prisons and was seen as a threat. And so the, the, the sort of ambition of this was, well, this would be a very powerful tool for, for controlling um, at least prison populations, if if we can get this working, and so that's the origin of solitary confinement. And then, as you get into the kind of late sixties and early seventies, um, and you get um, prison rebellions happening a lot more, you get Attica, uh, you get um, you know people like George Jackson um, writing about how you know prison is a space of revolutionary organizing and so on. Um, uh, they they start to build more and more of these units um, that began as this kind of psychological experiment to um, isolate people and um, you know attempt to essentially remould them through this practice uh, into compliant um, prisons right and so by the time you get to um, you know the end of the twentieth century you have I mean this thing's expanded massively in proportion to the expansion of mass incarceration itself um, you know which also dramatically increases we've got supermax prisons and we've got really a form of mass torture mm -hmm. being inflicted on tens of thousands of people constantly and this is an inheritance from the cold war absolutely right that's extraordinary right and then with the war on terror it's globalized right i mean that's that's the model that then you get deployed to guantanamo abu Ghraib, bagram and so on you know um as well as um i mean it, it you know as well as a lot of other places it's it's a uh, it's a very widespread phenomenon. It's a technology that's been exported around the world. Final question. Mm -hmm. And again, this was really fascinating for me, was um, Enoch Powell and his journey from being somebody who, you know, supported imperial preference and the empire becoming a neoliberal. Mm. Uh, so can you explain this a little bit? Because it's fascinating. Yeah. So, you know, so, um, yeah, so Enoch Powell was a, an enthusiast for the British empire and was a intelligence officer in India, you know, a military intelligence officer, They're kind of one of the bureaucrats administering the imperial project through um, the 1940s. And, um, and then, you know, 1947, when India liberates itself and, and Pakistan liberates itself, he has this kind of personal crisis. And he's like talked about this in interviews. He's sitting on the streets of London in the middle, right through the night. He won't go to sleep. Just like, what happened? Like, what happened? You know, like, I can't believe this thing that I had so much uh, faith in that was so much a part of my identity has been taken away from me, right? So it goes through the next few decades trying to figure out like, what to, like how to rethink really what is England's identity if it isn't the empire? You know, that's, that's the question for him, right? And, um, and he's also, 
knocking about with the newly formed Institute of Economic Affairs, right, which is the first neoliberal think tank um, kind of formed um, at the instigation of Hayek in London. Um, and the Institute of Economic Affairs have more or less recruited Powell to be their advocate in parliament, right? And he's starting to think there's something in this idea that, that um, you know, that's coming from Hayek, that you could actually organize society as this big kind of um, uh, free market system, which removes um, the constant responsibility of politicians to have to think about um, how are the economic resources of a society going to be distributed? It doesn't become a problem anymore. You just leave it to the market, right? The market decides, right? And he likes that idea because it um, it seems to him to offer a new way of thinking about um, how to re-energize England, right? And he gets this idea that there's before the empire, there was a kind of spirit in England of... of um, kind of entrepreneurialism, individual kind of get up and go, you know, like um, kind of a kind of um, national character that he thinks actually got lost in the Imperial Project because the Imperial Project made it too easy for Britain, right? It didn't have to compete as hard. It was, it was, it became kind of lazy, right? And so the, 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 the process he goes through is a kind of, a rethinking of empire as actually this kind of interlude in a longer history of English identity that was actually a mistake for England, right? Because because of that kind of uh, effect it had culturally on on the English character. So he sees the market as a way to bring back that character of you know that competitiveness is going to is going to bring us back to really being have, having to be much more agile, think on our feet, create new things, be entrepreneurial, be thrifty, be adventurous, right? Um, and so he's a neoliberal. Um, he doesn't want the Commonwealth anymore at that point because the Commonwealth feels to him like another way to create these kind of protections for British industry, shielding it from the competition he feels it needs. And then um, his he and so then when he thinks about well, what would it look like to implement this political project as a conservative government? Because he's you know he's been a minister in conservative government. Um, he understands that it's going to he's going to he's going against the grain of everything that, about british politics at that point you know where you've got trade unions you know in and out of downing street every every week negotiating prices and wages and so on and that's the standard way of doing things unions aren't you know what they have been since the 1980s as this kind of dangerous thing in society they're part of the way the system runs right and so we, he understands that he's going to have to get rid of unions, he's going to have to kind of go to war against the working class, as it, as, or at least organized labor, as, as it's been understood at that time. Um, and he's, and he's, so he needs some way to be able to present this to working class people as, as in their interests, right? And so tries out various versions of, of talking about patriotism and so on to try and create this kind of sense of working class nationalism that's going to be the underpinnings of the neoliberal project that he envisages. Um, and then when he, when he um, starts talking about race in this story is when he becomes, um, he starts to see that there's, a, there's a, a way for him to use race to really do this, right? And so he um, starts to make the argument that precisely because Britain is, is bringing in workers from the Caribbean and bringing workers from South Asia who have a different culture, that they're not going to be able to sign up to this um, uh, this kind of idea of Englishness that he's he's developing, um, because for him, the, you know, as he puts it, um, skin color is like a uniform. It's like a, it's not you know it's it's very relevant to your kind of cultural identity for him, right? And um, so he you know he makes the argument we were talking about earlier that that there's just a the cultural incompatibility there, but the the important thing for him about that cultural incompatibility is that it means that there's no way that if we have, you know, a significant, you know, what would have been at the time about a million workers with, from, from, uh, you know, from these different cultures, there's no way they're going to sign up to my neoliberal project because they've got communal values. I don't believe in individual private property, like we need them to. And if they're in, in the working class, they're going to start influencing white workers to think like that as well. And they are going to be this constant kind of, limit on what we're able to achieve for neoliberalism. So there's a direct relationship between him arguing for the 
basically ethnic cleansing of Britain and removing a million people of colour from Britain and the neoliberal project that he's starting to um, advocate for, you know. And he is basically Britain's first, you know, neoliberal, um, certainly first neoliberal in parliament in, in Britain. So his opposition to, to, to brown and black people is fundamentally because they are an obstruction to the, to the construction of a, of a market society. Absolutely. And it's, right. that I, it's basically, it's allowing race to embed the ideas of, of neoliberalism. So it's a, the, the discourse around race, which of course, I think everybody knows him for, right? Very few people know the stuff on the economics. Yeah. That was a means to an end, which was to embed a certain way of doing the economy. Right, right. And so what's happening is there's a, there's a you know, I mean, Stuart Hall, talks about racism modality in which classes live, right? And so, I mean, that, that captures this, right? Is that there's a, what's really going on is a, is a, a kind of class struggle that's operating on the terrain of race and culture, right? Um, now that doesn't mean that you can just simply say, oh, if only we could, um, you know, get rid of these ideas about race, we can black and white unite and fight. Um, it, because the, the racial differences are material as well as, as well as ideological. And therefore, there's going to be situations in which you can unite. But there's also going to be perhaps more often situations in which you're going to need autonomous struggle by black people, autonomous struggle by um, Asian people in Britain, because that they have a different relationship to capitalism, right? There's a racial division of labor that positions them differently in relation to capitalism, right? So there's, you know, so the question of where, the, you know, when do you get that unity, but when do you not? Or when do you, when is the unity of, of black workers in Britain going to be with white workers in Britain? And when is that black, black workers in Britain going to unite with, say, liberation struggles in other parts of the world? You know, where do you find that unity? That's a matter of the, you know, the particular contingencies of where you're at at that particular moment. It's going to look different at different times. Um, uh, but, you know, those, that is actually the key questions that, you know, that you start with when you're trying to build an anti-racist movement. Um, you've got to make that kind of assessment. Um, uh, but the, um, but what you can't do is start from the position that Enoch Powell just didn't like, you know, there's, there's nothing more to it except Enoch Powell was just a racist. It was just a, a set of attitudes in his head. And that's why he was the way he was, you know, no, he like, just read the guy, listen to him. It's clear that there's a lot more going on and it's tied up with a whole structure of what he thinks about what Britain should be like centered on, um, the question of you know um, economic markets, right, and the and the cultural conditions he wants to create to make those economics function in this inhuman way, where we're all competing with each other, right? That can't just happen naturally. Arun, we'll finish there. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much.